I, I'm very happy to note that um, during the survey earlier, Asia is very important to most of you. So I'm sure because A Asia is very important to most of you, you are all very familiar with the constantly changing headlines in Asia. I'd like to, I'd like to focus on two of them. Um, I'd like to focus on these two with the five minutes given to me because um, these are interconnected and worth expounding on in the sense that uh, number one, they threaten to create instability. Um, and this creation of instability uh, could greatly impact other, other regions. And number two, um, they most represent um, geopolitical undercurrents that I am sure um, this same geopolitical undercurrents are also present in your region. The first of that is the rising tide of illiberalism in Asia. Um, almost always, this rising tide of illiberalism is guided by um, online disinformation and influence operations. And this rising tide of, of illiberalism across Asia, we see that there are many regimes now that are gravitating towards authoritarianism. And this gravi gravitation to authoritarianism uh, we see regimes spurning a rights-based order. We see regimes that um, now favor a more polarized society. Uh, we see regimes that are capitalizing on the frustrations of the people. And the effect of a very polarized society is that uh, the, the common ground for di discourse has been receding already. And this brings us to the second one that is worth um, expounding on. And that second one is expansionism. And expansionism, um, the, the rising tide of illiberalism dovetails to expansionism in the sense that we see that when the public has been silenced or when the public has been co-opted or um, when the discourse has receded and along with it the pressure of scrutiny, regimes can sometimes become emboldened to assert their idea of order outwards beyond their national boundaries. Uh, we see it now um, in the South China Sea dispute. We see it now in the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, and we expect to see it in many other um, places all over the world if we are not able to stop um, what we are seeing now in Asia. But I would like to end my five minutes with a bit of hope. I am still very hopeful. I am still very hopeful that the technology that has been used to spew lies, uh, that, has been, um, that has been used to spew hatred, we can also use that to bring hope we can also use that to bring um, unity. We have seen a lot of many encouraging um, situations all over the world. We see Iran. Uh, we see the Philippines. We saw in the Philippines during the last elections. The technology has also been used by the people to unite, um, to, to fight for democracy. And there is momentum. Um, we, we see hope that there is a lot of reason for us to sustain that momentum. So I end this five minutes, minutes with inviting you to the next 15 minutes that will be given to me later on during the day to talk more about the state of democracy in Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lenny Robredo, for um, this short overview. And as Lenny has mentioned, of course, we'll hear more from her on uh, the effect that this information has on democracy in Asia and worldwide later in today. For now, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage for his view on the state of Asia, Professor Tomohiko Taniguchi, a professor at Japan's uh, Keio University. I first met Taniguchi-san in 2018 at the Prime Minister's residence in Tokyo when he was a senior advisor on foreign policy to Shinzo Abe, who, as we all know, of course, was tragically assassinated this summer. I have been hoping to get Professor Taniguchi to Switzerland for many years. I'm very, very thrilled um, that he could join us today, and I'm inviting him on stage for his view on the state of Asia. Please. Thank you, Nico, and thank you, uh, Chairman of um, Swiss Re and um, Nico's capable staff. I'm very much pleased to be here in Zurich, Switzerland. 
where is the state uh, of Asia like? I think it's, um, it was, the Asia was synonymous to backwardness for Hegel, Marx, Weber. In the 1980s, Asia represented growth. And over the last 20, 30 years, Asia was synonym to future-oriented, hope-driven economic growth. However, the next two to five years will actually determine what the state of Asia will be like in the rest of the 21st century. Why? 2024 is a benchmark year. I am very much keen on looking at what's going to happen in that year. January 2024, if the past is any guide, Taiwan is going to have its presidential election. A few months ago, Chinese Communist Party issued its third version of Taiwan white paper. It's the only third version, but that was an awesome sort of document because in it, Chinese Communist Party declared that Madam Tsai's, President Tsai's party of DPP, uh, Democratic Progressive Party, must be, quote, unquote, removed. How could they remove an established party from the political scene? There may be dozens of ways, but one of which is to use disinformation, fake news, influence, uh, diplomacy, and so forth. The, 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 the least, uh, I think, uh, uh, objective for the Chinese Communist Party, at least, is to remove the DPP from the ruling position. Now, 2024 being such an important year, 2027 is more, even more important. This year has given another five-year term to Xi Jinping. And the outcome of the 20th Party Congress is something that we all have to spend much time to study because it's an important um, benchmark for the Chinese Communist Party. We can no longer talk anything about what China is going to do. Instead, we must focus our attention on what this single individual of Xi Jinping is going to do. 2027, he is going to have to face another party contest. Whether or not he could further extend his five-year term again until 2032. And 2027 is going to also be an year for PLA's centenary celebration. If you try to put yourself into the shoes of Xi Jinping, you would certainly want to bring back Taiwan. Because Taiwan is very much an important piece for the fulfillment of Xi's version of China dream. Now is the time, now is the time therefore, for Japan, the Philippines, and Australia, India, democratic countries and their leaders to stand tall and work together to regain faith in democracy and regain hope for the future state of Asia. Thank you. And for the last very short opening salvo in what the state of Asia is, it's my pleasure now to welcome C. Raja Mohan, who is a senior fellow at the newly opened Asia Study Policy Institute in Delhi. We've heard from you already yesterday, and we're thrilled to have you with us again today. Raja, please. Thank you.
think I've already spoken a lot last night uh, for those of you who've been there. So we'll try and be briefer than the uh, other two speakers. Let me just make uh, three points uh, in the five minutes that I have. The first, uh, you know, until recently, uh, the fashionable thing to say in Europe was, will Asia's future be Europe's past? That is, would Asia emulate Europe of the 19th and the early 20th century, get into a serious internal conflict? Or would Asia's future be Europe's present, where Europe integrates itself, and does Asia emulate Europe uh, to become a more coherent, transcend the geopolitical, uh, transcend the nationalist, and come together as a, as a continent? At least still recently, it looked like uh, in Asia was emulating Europe, but my sense is uh, things have changed, and uh, the idea that Europe is in the lead and Asia would simply emulate Europe, I think that phase is over. I mean, I think today we'll have to frame already, if those of you who read the U.S. National Security Strategy will see, uh, notwithstanding Ukraine, notwithstanding this war in Europe, that the principal theater of contestation would be the Indo-Pacific, which is a kind of bigger name for Asia. But the principal contestation in the years to come, in spite of what's happening in Europe and the distraction that it has done, the major contestation of global politics uh, is going to be uh, in Asia. So therefore, that's the second point I wanted to make. And, and I think uh, not only in the geopolitical domain, but also in the economic domain, much of the future growth in the international system, even a, a China that slows down, but the rest of Asia is growing. Uh, therefore, much of the new economic opportunities, of the ex much of the additional growth that's going to come into the international system uh, is going to come from Asia. And I think that is where both in economic sense as well as in the geopolitical sense, you have Asia is going to be far more consequential and not an adjunct to Europe, uh, unlike in the last uh, 400 uh, odd years. And in some ways, I think uh, given the priority nature of US-Asia relationships, uh, you're going to see uh, Asia are setting the trend uh, for many, many things. And finally, I think uh, for us, uh, Europe has a critical role to play in shaping Asia's future. That this is uh, for 400 years, so we've seen one type of relationship between Europe and Asia. But today, I think Asia needs Europe to come back, notwithstanding, I think we passed the post-colonial moment. Uh, we need Europe to contribute to the stabilization of Asia in its own way, and Europe has a number of strengths, and I think those strengths will be needed uh, in Asia. As Asia seeks a new equilibrium within itself, uh, a rising Asia, but it's a divided Asia, but an Asia that is seeking a fresh equilibrium within itself, and an Asia that seeks to play a larger role in the world, will need to do a lot more with Europe, and, uh, and for us, uh, not to let the uh, American debates overwhelm us, uh, because our interaction between Europe and Asia uh, is a much older one, uh, and it predates the colonial period. Uh, since the time at least Alexander the Great showed up in our part of the world, uh, we've had all kinds of interactions. But I think today there is a moment where Asia and Europe need to craft a new framework of mutual engagement uh, that would produce a different uh, kind of results for the world. I'll stop you.